<coughs> thank you, uh, Vikram, and thank you all. It's a great privilege for me to introduce Professor Nico Slate of the Carnegie Mellon University, the author of this wonderful biography of Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. Uh, before I talk about Nico and his book, and before he talks at much greater length about his book, I'd like to say a little bit about the series in which this book appears. This series is called Indian Lives, and uh, a brief series description goes as follows. India is not the most important, nor the most powerful country in the world. However, it has strong claims to being the most interesting. This modern nation is heir to a rich civilizational history with the rise and fall of mighty empires, juxtaposed with the rise and renewal of great religious traditions. Traditions in the plural. The past two centuries have witnessed an epic struggle against colonial rule, as well as the construction of the world's largest democracy in the inhospitable soil of the world's most hierarchical society. This history, ancient and modern, has featured many extraordinary individuals active in a variety of fields, politics, spirituality, social reform, science, literature, art, music, film, sport, and more. Each book in the Indian Life series, written by a leading scholar, focuses on the life and legacy of an important figure from Indian history. Now, when I thought of this series, I had in mind uh, a curious paradox, namely that while the intelligent general reader uh, likes to approach history through the lives of singular, remarkable, eccentric, controversial, complicated individuals, scholars traditionally uh, have uh, resisted writing biographies, you know, in the academy, uh, in the Indian Academy, in the American Academy, where Nico teaches, all across the world, scholars are told uh, that to spend three or five or, God forbid, ten years on a single individual is to uh, disregard wider social and cultural and historical processes. It is to subscribe to a great man theory of history. And so the writing of biography has been uh, really, uh, for the last half century and more, treated with condescension and often contempt in the academy. So if you write a biography, you're unlikely to get a job. Uh, if you write two, even if you get a job and your second book is a biography, you will not get tenure. I mean, this is quite common among young scholars in America. Now, but the intelligent general reader who likes reading about history, you know, uh, is hesitant to uh, really deal with large ex ex abstractions like society, culture, the state, technology, class struggle, and what have you. Now, this gap between uh, uh, a hunger for biography among the general reader and uh, the conspicuous uh, lack of interest by scholars to fill this gap has been filled, so the gap has been filled by ambitious entrepreneurs, often lacking scholarly training, uh, occasionally opportunistic charlatans, etc., etc., and I always felt that we had to nurture a biographical tradition uh, in our country and about our country. And it so happened that I became a biographer myself by accident when many, many years ago, in fact, several decades ago, I embarked on a life of the anthropologist and activist, very relevant. Uh, then I wrote a two-volume book on Gandhi. And now I thought, now that I'm sort of almost in my dotage, not quite, but approaching, and I don't really have large books to write on my own anymore, I thought I would curate a series of this kind. And by this time, I knew enough scholars around the world uh, who were, uh, you know, real scholars who had paid their dues in the archives, who enjoyed rigorous and uh, primary research, uh, who were not merely storytellers, but had a sociological and analytical sensibility, who could use uh, their subject, their particular individual subject, uh, as a window into larger cultural, social, historical processes. And that's the idea of this series. The f and uh, the first book, which came out last September, <coughs> was, is by the great scholar of ancient India, Patrick Olivelle, and it's on Ashoka. Now, in that case, in Nico's case, 
about the, th the three books that have appeared in this series so far. I'll tell you about each of them. The second book is by Chitralekha Zutshi on Sheikh Abdullah. And I already knew that Chitralekha was working on this book, which because he'd been in touch with me uh, about sources and materials and approaches. So I asked her, will you, and I knew the quality of her previous scholarship. She is the leading scholar of modern Kashmir. So I asked Chitralekha, will you give this book to my series? She said, yes. In the case of Patrick Olivelle, uh, we were in correspondence about something else altogether, about our international collaboration on academic research. And I wrote to Patrick, I said, you know, you're such a great scholar. Have you ever considered writing a biography? He said, no. I said, why don't you write on Ashoka? So he came back in a week and said, what a splendid idea. I spent my whole life around Ashoka, you know, uh, law, politics, society in ancient India. I know the relevant languages that he's produced this magnificent book on Ashoka. Nico, I think, is somewhere in between. Uh, he had been interested in Kamla Devi for a very long time. We first met 20 years ago in the archives in Delhi when he was writing uh, a path-breaking book, his first book, which is an absolutely path-breaking book, called Colored Cosmopolitanisms, which is an account of the flow of ideas and, uh, 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 between India and America, particularly with regard to civil rights. And Kamla Devi had figured there in a completely new dimension, unknown to me. And Possibly he was thinking of writing a book on Kamla Devi, maybe not absolutely sure, but I knew he'd been interested in Kamla Devi for a very long time, apart from that first book, where there's a wonderful chapter on Kamla Devi's trip through the American South in the 1930s, carrying the ideas of Gandhian civil disobedience at a time when Martin Luther King was really a baby in arms. I had uh, heard a fabulous lecture that uh, Nico gave comparing the lives of Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay and the American feminist civil rights activist Polly Murray. Uh, so I asked Nico, and he has produced this great book for this series. I mean, there are <clears throat> another dozen or 15 books of this kind along, um, along the way, each written by a reputed scholar, but each focusing on an individual. Uh, you know, and I think that's, um, that gives a kind of, uh, it bridges the kind of uh, gap between the academy and the general readership. I want you to bridge. If you think of Chitalekha's book on uh, Sheikh Abdullah, if she had called it a political and social history for, of modern Kashmir, uh, it would possibly have been less appealing than Sheikh Ab a biography of Sheikh Abdullah through whose life and struggles and, uh, you know, uh, you get to know a great deal about the political and social history of modern Kashmir. Now, Diko will speak about this, his book. Uh, it is really a superb work of scholarship, rigorously researched, beautifully written, as close to being definitive as any work of this kind will be. Kamala Devi herself, uh, I say in my introduction to the book, straddles so many fields that at a, as a multifaceted personality, I think she can only be compared to Tagore. Uh, and I hope the Bengalis allow me to travel to Calcutta after this. Uh, but I stick by that. I'm willing to defend that judgment. And of course, uh, given where she came from, as a woman, a child, widow, she had a much more difficult personal journey than Tagore's. Now, so Nico's <coughs> lecture and then his book, which is on sale outside, which I think will convince you both of, of the quality of the scholarship and the claims I've made on behalf of Kamla Devi. I'll just say one last thing before handing the floor over to Nico. And this is about who gets to write about what kind of subject, you know, uh, in the academy, uh, there's this whole very anguished and uh, angst-ridden debate about representation. You know, can a Brahmin write about a Dalit? Can a man write about a woman? Uh, can a f f foreigner write about India? And in my own work, I haven't, I mean, I don't really participate very much in arcane academic debates of this kind. But if I was to look at my own career, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> I'm an Indian who's written about Englishmen. I'm a Brahmin who's written about Dalits. And I always, I think the act of transgression of this kind is an act of empathy. The job of a historian is to enter into times past and the lives and struggles and mentalities of individuals he or she is not supposed to understand, let alone empathize with. And I think to have an American man writing about the greatest Indian feminist of the modern times, I think is perfectly fitting and appropriate. Nico.
Thank you so, thank you so much, Ram. There was an incredibly generous introduction, but there was only one thing I'd like to push back on briefly, and that's that Ram said he doesn't have any big books left in him. I don't know how he defines big, but I would encourage you all, if you haven't already gotten this uh, volume, The Cooking of Books, I encourage you all to get it. I read the first uh, sections of it earlier today while sitting outside, and I was profoundly moved by the vastness of the spirit that's in this volume. It's a spirit that I've seen in many of Rom's books. It's the spirit of, of, of a true humanist, uh, someone who approaches the study of the past, not just with an academic lens, but with, 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 a, with a big heart. Um, and it was especially meaningful for me because if you don't know already, this book is a, about the relationship between Rom and his longtime editor. Um, and that, that relationship is profoundly deep in a way I've, I've never experienced with an editor, and I, I think very few have. Um, but I will say that it resonated for me because uh, Ram has been to me uh, much more than just the series editor of this book, but has in fact been a, a longtime champion of my work ever since we met now some 20 years ago, as he mentioned in the archives in Delhi. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I would just at the outset like to say thank you, Ram for all that you've done for me and all the ways you've championed my own work. I also want to thank um, the leadership of the uh, Bangalore International Center, um, Vikram, who spoke earlier, Sandhya, who helped organize this event, everyone else involved in bringing us together. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be here with you all. As I expect many of you know, Kamala Devi, amongst the many, many institutions she helped to found, was very involved, uh, in fact, one of the key figures in the founding of the India International Center in Delhi, and I think believed very strongly in the mission of venues like this. So I'm, I'm very deeply honored to be here in particular to speak about her legacy. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming here. It's such a pleasure to uh, speak about Kamala Devi here at this place, here in Bangalore, here in India, but I have to say it's also quite intimidating to speak to this particular group because as I discovered uh, when I arrived, there are many people here that knew Kamala Devi personally and have direct knowledge of all of her work. Um, Mr. Rajiv Sethi is here. I actually benefited tremendously from some uh, exchanges we had during the research for this book. There are many others in the audience that have a direct relationship to Kamala Devi. Uh, my, uh, my sense is that this is um, a testament to the vastness of her legacy in the world that I expect probably wherever I would go to speak in India, we would find people that have been personally touched by her legacy. Um, that is a, an absolutely wonderful thing, but it's also terrifying for the biographer um, because, of course, my own knowledge of her, although uh, you know, shaped by many years of research, is that of a scholar and not that of someone who directly knew her. So I hope in the Q&A time period we're able to hear from some of those who knew her directly. Um, I am very eager to learn from all of you, just as I hope that I'm able to share something with you today. Um, lastly, friends, I would actually like to thank um, Kamala Devi and express my deep gratitude uh, for the legacy she left for us all. Um, as Ram mentioned, she was a, a tremendous influence on my first book, and actually I dedicated um, my third book to her and to a, a very uh, remarkable African-American activist. Um, and throughout my entire career as a historian, she's been a, a sort of guiding light to me uh, for reasons that I'll explain later. Um, so I, I feel deep gratitude to her and to the legacy uh, that she's left uh, for all of us. I want to start with a story. Um, it's actually the story that introduced me to Kamala Devi. It comes from her memoir, and it's about an experience she had in the spring of 1941 when she was traveling across the American South. She was sitting in a train, uh, and just as it crosses the border into the American state of Louisiana, the, the ticket conductor comes and angrily tells her that she has to leave the carriage that she's in. Turns out it's a whites-only carriage. This is at the time of racial segregation, so-called Jim Crow and the train conductor assumes that Kamala Devi must be African American. Now at this point, she could have very easily told him that she was in fact a famous Indian uh, dignitary, friends with Mahatma Gandhi. She had just come from meeting with the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, and his wife. She had met with members of the United States Supreme Court and Congress. She could have told him, I am a famous important figure from India, leave me alone, and he would have done so. Instead, she said, 
and I'm quoting her, I am a colored woman, obviously, and I refuse to leave my seat. And by using that language of color, Kamala Devi very explicitly linked herself to African Americans who were known at that time as colored. And she did so in a way that I find still quite revolutionary. If you look at this, this is an advertisement for a lecture that she gave in New York, and you'll see that the subject is the culture and the future of the darker races. That idea of darker races was a bridge between the struggles of African Americans, the struggles of colonized people in Africa, with the struggles of people here in India and in other parts of Asia and indeed in other parts of the world. That kind of expansive conception of anti-racist solidarity is something that many people contributed to, but none as creatively or consistently as Kamala Devi. In fact, one of the many things that I think we have to uh, recognize more than has been recognized about Kamala Devi is the central role she played in creating what was later called the Third World or the Global South. And her radical vision for that kind of solidarity is one that I still think shapes all of us. Well, Kamala Devi was a truly global figure. Um, this is one of the many books that she wrote, this one in war-torn China about her time in China. But her global vision, um, uh, this is the Indian International Center uh, near the founding of uh, the uh, Prince of Japan here. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, she was central to that um, institution. Her global vision was also a vision that transgressed borders of race, borders of religion, borders of identity, and crucially, borders of different social movements. And here, friends, is the central argument of my book. Um, there's so much to say about Kamala Devi. It was very hard to try to come to some sense of what's the real takeaway that I hope people get from reading this book. If there's just one thing I hope they get, um, it's that Kamala Devi demonstrates the centrality of bridge building to the Indian freedom struggle the way in which the Indian freedom struggle was never just about getting rid of British rule, but it was always about fighting multiple forms of injustice, sexism and patriarchy, struggles against racism, struggles against inequities of caste and class. These are all different issues that Kamala Devi fought in different ways at different times in her life, and she resolutely refused to be boxed in or labeled as if she could only advance one struggle or another. And that's, that kind of bridge building, I think, is absolutely vital to the world today. In my country, the United States, here in India, and throughout the world, the ability of people of goodwill to come together across divides and fight against shared oppression is one that I think we can all um, learn from. That's why I started with the story of her on that train. But there's actually a second reason that I want to share, a more personal one. Uh, for why I started with that story, and that's because, as I said briefly at the outset, it's that story that introduced me to Kamala Devi some 20 years ago when I was just starting my PhD research. It's that story that drew me to the archives where I met Ram, and Ram must remember this. He has a much better memory than I do. Um, I was not alone in that archive. In fact, I had my mother with me. This is not a common practice in the Amer American Academy, um, but I highly recommend it to anyone. Um, in fact, it, it, it made for actually much less than half the time because my mother's a much quicker reader than I am and extremely sharp. Uh, but at that moment in time, she was actually deep in grief. Um, if you'll just allow me, I'll briefly uh, explain some of the personal background here because it, it uh, helps explain why this book is so important to me. Uh, my older brother had passed away in a tragic car accident just a year before I started my PhD. And my mother was like m most mothers that have lost children. She was completely broken by this. She'd had to give up her job. She became really utterly and totally dependent on me. She moved in with me. Um, and so I knew I had to bring her with me to India because she had to come with me wherever I went. But also I hoped that in coming to India, she would find a new sense of purpose, a new reason to keep living. Um, and in fact, she did, among other ways, by connecting to Kamala Devi. She helped me look through Kamala Devi's papers and I hadn't known this at the time because I actually, when I started, knew very little about Kamala Devi's own personal story. But as many of you in the audience know, and I'll talk more briefly later, Kamala Devi was in many ways a single mother. Of course, she did have a husband. I'll talk more about him. Um, but much of her life, she spent raising her son on her own, which is also true for my mother, um, who, like Kamala Devi, um, was a, a remarkable woman who had incredibly good taste in almost everything, but not so much in husbands. Uh, so. Um, when I researched the story of Kamala Devi, I did so as a historian 
interested in someone that did so much to shape contemporary India, so much to shape the world, but also as a son who was drawn to the story of a remarkable woman who managed to do all the things she did while also raising her son to a large degree on her own. Okay, well, how do I want to approach this today? Again, this is a daunting task to speak about someone who's so well known to many of you. My only advantage, I think, here is that Kamala Devi had so many different facets to her life that my hope is that those of you who, for example, know her through her work in the actually foundational work in the field of crafts and the arts might be less familiar with some of her early activism on the global stage or vice versa. Those who are drawn to her early work in the women's movement might know less about her socialist career. So I'm gonna to try to very quickly move through her life. I'm gonna actually go in reverse order from the end towards the beginning. Um, and I'm just gonna to try to touch on some of the many ways that Kamaladevi shaped the making of modern India, hopefully planting some seeds that we can then return to in the Q&A and have a deeper conversation about whichever facet of her life um, we'd like to return to. Um, this is an image of Kamala Devi with her son um, uh, in, uh, in, the mid in the midst of the Second World War. I'll come back to her personal life later. Okay, I wanna start with um, uh, her work in, in the sphere of arts and crafts, which my hunch is, is the part of her life that continues to have the greatest legacy in India today. Um, in fact, when I did the research for this book, I was truly overwhelmed by the number of people, artisans, um, uh, advocates for the arts and, and crafts, um, and others that were profoundly shaped by Kamala Devi's work in this, in this field. The first thing I just want to point out, and, and this should be perhaps obvious, but I think it bears noting, is that Kamala Devi's relationship to the arts and crafts was heavily shaped by her earlier politics. I think it's fundamentally wrong to suggest that there's some kind of major break between her early anti-colonial activism and anti-racism and her work fighting against sexism and her later work in the field of arts and crafts. Um, she approached the um, advocacy of arts and crafts with a deep sense of social purpose, a deep sense of the revolutionary potential for these fields, not just to bring beauty into the world, which she cared about so deeply, not just to preserve these remarkable traditions, which again, she, she cared about very deeply, but also to continue to fight against the injustices she had been fighting against for, for, for long periods of time. All right, so what is this historical um, little um, poster doing here? So this is a poster for the first World Festival of Negro Arts, which is the term that was used at that time, held in Dakar, Senegal in 1966. Kamala Devi was, to my knowledge, the only non-African or person of African descent who was explicitly invited to attend that gathering by the president of Senegal because not only was she seen as, in some ways, the mother of Indian arts and crafts, or at least one of the most important figures in that field, but because she was also widely known as someone who, who had for decades fought to build bridges with people of African descent and who actively saw this, uh, this world of arts and crafts as an opportunity to continue to fight against white imperialism and uh, the hegemony of Europe and the United States. So when she goes there, she meets with a variety of African figures, also African-American figures, Langston Hughes, for example, the great African-American poet is there. She's really wearing multiple hats at the same time. Again, forgive me for driving this point home, but I just find it so compelling. She refuses to be boxed in. She's not just a patron of the arts here. She's also an anti-racist activist. Okay, of course, her commitment to the arts and crafts, though, was deeply personal. Um, this is, I think, a rare photo that I was able to find of Kamala Devi smiling. Um, she was a fairly stoic figure. Again, those who knew her well can speak more to this, but I've spoken to many people. Um, she's, she's not, she, she didn't suffer fools. Maybe that's the best way to put it. She's not someone who would be effusive unless uh, she was really moved to be so. She was a fairly reserved person. And yet, all of that, went away when she was immersed in the world of the arts or when she was meeting with a master artisan or craftsperson. That direct experience, whether it was a theater or a music or um, someone who was cr creating a, a work of pottery, someone creating a, a, some sort of textile, that direct engagement with the production of art moved her spirit to a lighter, more delighted, more joyful place. 
So even though I want to assert that this period of her life was deeply connected to her politics, it was also much, much beyond that. And I was glad that Ram mentioned Tagore earlier. I think this is where Tagore's legacy becomes so strong in her, even though she also drew on many other legacies. There was something very profound about her love for beauty, um, which is something I'll come back to later. And this is also a place in her life where she's actively um, uh, empowering and mentoring younger people. Um, many of the people in this room, again, were a direct um, uh, ben beneficiaries of this work, uh, but there's several photos in the book. This is one with um, several figures I expect people in the room already know who were involved in, in advancing the legacy of Kamala Devi through the arts and crafts. Um, I, I could mention dozens and dozens of names of people that I felt honored to interview who said, I did this work because of Kamala Devi. She inspired me, she directed me, she guided me. So she was a, a, an educational figure, a mentor figure, as well as um, um, someone who was herself directly connected to this work. Okay, friends, this is, this is where talks like this get painful because I could talk for about five more hours about our connection to arts and crafts, but I'm going to keep us moving. And hopefully we'll come back. Um, and just imagine if it's hard to talk about her. Imagine how hard it is to write a single book, right? I wanted to write ten. I, I should have asked Rom, could I write ten, please? He probably would have said no. Um, but I'm going to move us through. I'm going to use the Bancor horse as a bridge. Of course, this um, image is a very famous one in the history of crafts and in, uh, in, in post-independence India. Um, I'll just point out that Kamala Devi's connection to the, the, the Bankura horse goes all the way back to the, um, to the early 1940s. This is well before she emerges as sort of the, the patron saint of the arts in post-independence India. Um, and it's a direct linkage between that later time period and her earlier activism. And just as a one quick moment in that long saga, I want to turn to her very profound work with the refugees created by partition. These are images I expect many of you will be familiar with. These are famous images of those forced to move during the time of partition, uh, many of whom ended up in camps uh, where they struggled not just to survive but to build new lives. Um, as I expect many of you know, Kamala Devi played a very important role in, in helping forge opportunities for these refugees um, to create their own livelihoods, um, most notably in the, in the large city of Faridabad. This is um, Jawaharlal Nehru speaking at Faridabad. Nehru was very supportive of this effort, but if you wanted to say who was really driving it, it was, a, it was really a group of women, Kamala Devi being one of the most important, who pushed forward the story of Faridabad and made it really an international success story. I found many articles from all around the world written at the time with people marveling at the success of Faridabad. And one of the key things they pointed out was actually what was most important to Kamala Devi. And that's that although figures like Nehru helped provide the legitimacy and the authority for this project, it was really the refugees themselves that built Faridabad. That was central to Kamala Devi's approach. She was deeply immersed in the cooperative movement. We can talk more about that. And believed at the outset that the refugees had to be empowered to build the structures to create their own enterprises, to run those enterprises. This is a button-making factory. This is a toy-making factory. Um, so the goal here is not just to provide alms to those who are struggling, but to empower them to continue their work. Okay, I'm moving fast here, friends. Forgive me. We're going even further back in time. This is a picture. Forgive it. It's um, fuzzy, um, but it's such a remarkable moment. This is um, contemporary Sri Lanka, then Ceylon in the late 1930s. Kamala Devi actually visits um, Sri Lanka several times. Um, at first, she's brought there to speak to the youth movement. She later becomes very important in the foundation of a socialist opposition, uh, which was both anti-colonial and socialist. And I chose this image to stress that Kamala Devi's socialism, although highly steeped in the Indian context, she was one of the founding figures of the Congress Socialists. Um, you know, uh, we can talk more about that if that's of interest to you. Um, but it was also profoundly international um, and shaped by international currents. Um, and that gave it a certain tinge that I think is very important, which is the tinge of a certain kind of openness. Um, she was a non-ideological socialist. She was always open to pushing the limits of how um, socialism was defined. Um, and in part, that's because her socialism came out and through the larger freedom struggle. Um, I, I'm still, this is like we're on a rocket ship, friends. We're moving back in time. So we were talking about her work with refugees. I wanted to briefly touch on her socialism. We can come back to that. I now want to start transitioning into a, 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 an area of her life I'll dwell upon more, 
which is her, her strong connection to the Gandhian freedom struggle, to Gandhi in particular, and also the way that she brought her activism as a woman and her struggle against sexism and patriarchy into that struggle. So I want to start with another story. This is the story of Kamala Devi's intervention in the Salt March. And this is one of the most fun stories to tell in the book. It's always fun to talk about someone standing up to a figure like Gandhi, um, but especially when the dynamic actually ends up being positive. So if you don't know the story already, you're in for a treat. Um, as I expect many of you know, when Gandhi launched the Salt March, uh, actually, you know, in the, in the month of March, uh, 1930, um, he did so with a specially chosen group of, I think, of, of 78 satyagrahis, all of whom were men. Um, and his vision for the Salt Satyagraha, the larger protest, was one in which women would have a role to play, but a very circumscribed role. He saw women doing relatively safe, relatively less confrontational forms of protest. Well, many of the leading women at that time uh, didn't like that one bit, and they refused to be boxed in in that way. But Kamala Devi was the only person that I know of who actually just went to Gujarat, joined the Salt March, and directly confronted Gandhi by arguing, using his own um, past writings, and saying, you yourself have said that part of the brilliance of nonviolence, of Satyagraha, is that it is open to all. Everyone can access it. It's a power that's universally available. Why limit the degree to which women can participate in this struggle? And, Ga and Gandhi agreed and changed his mind. And the Salt Satyagraha has then opened up. And Kamala Devi herself um, actively participates in the Salt Satyagraha. I was mentioning earlier to, um, uh, to someone in the audience that of all the different sources that I found most compelling and rich as I worked on this project, one of the most engaging were the police records of the Salt Satyagraha in, in Mumbai, then Bombay in which Kamala Devi played a very leading and very interesting role. Again, building bridges across different divides. She spent a lot of time getting women into the protest movement, but also a lot of time working with mill workers who had historically been aligned with the Communist Party, trying to convince them to shift their allegiance to the Congress and to actively join um, the Salt Satyagraha. So um, and this is an image of her marching. Kamala Devi was a, a, a Gandhian activist, but never a, a disciple or a devotee of Gandhi. And that's something we can come back to later. She's someone who learned from Gandhi, but also challenged him, which I think is actually quite compelling and important. Um, and one of the main ways she challenged him was by trying to challenge the, the patriarchy built into the freedom struggle. That, of course, goes very deep into, into Kamala Devi's own story. Her first participation in politics was as an advocate for women's rights. This is um, Kamala Devi, you can see her on the far left of this image, um, participating in a gathering, an, uh, an international gathering of women activists. Um, this is another example where Kamala Devi transgresses multiple boundaries at the same time. So she is here advocating as a woman, but also advocating as an Indian, because when she was in these sorts of gatherings of women activists, well, within such a gathering, sexism itself wasn't exactly an issue, but, but racism and imperialism were, all right? uh, because in many of these international gatherings, they're dominated by white women from the US and Europe, many of whom are perfectly happy to attack patriarchy, but not so interested in attacking imperialism. And in fact, as many of you know, um, the existence of patriarchy in various forms of sexism was often used as an excuse for imperialism. So Kamala Devi, I think walked a very Im impressive and important middle ground where she was able to say, yes, there are real problems we must confront with an Indian society, but no, you can't use those problems to justify British rule. In fact, we need to fight against sexism and imperialism um, at the same time. This is another image of her in Europe. This is in Berlin, um, where again, she fought against sexism, but also against patriarchy. Um, this is an image of uh, Kamala Devi, uh, again, on the left here in this image. Um, I, I find this image quite compelling because it just drives home that when she's in groups of women activists, she fights against imperialism, racism, classism. But then when she's in a gathering of activists in the Indian National Congress, she's usually one of the very few women involved, especially at the higher levels. There she confronts patriarchy um, and sexism. One second, it's just... Let's advance if you can. It's frozen there. Ah, lovely. Okay. Um, so as many of you know, Kamala Devi's opposition to patriarchy goes all the way back to her childhood. Um, she was um, heavily shaped by the death of her father 
And as she writes about in her memoir, by the way in which her mother's inheritance was limited by the patriarchal inheritance laws and traditions of that time, um, she was uh, married as a, as a child, and her, um, her, her husband um, died not long thereafter, so she was a child widow at a time when someone of her class and community in that position was expected to live a life of austerity and seclusion. She was very fortunate, though, in that her mother and the uh, father of, of the boy that she had been married to were both very progressive in their outlook on such matters. And so Kamala Devi was able to defy the gender norms of that time to continue to advance her education and then later to remarry um, across the lines of, of, of uh, caste and of region. Um, she writes about almost every facet of her life in her remarkable memoir, which I encourage you all to read. And yet she writes remarkably little about many facets of her personal life. She, um, uh, barely mentions her husband, for example. Um, if you could go forward one slide, please. Um, the uh, poet and actor Harindranath Chattopadhyay, um, she mentions him passingly as a colleague who, with whom she worked in the theater early on in life. Um, Kamala Devi was a very private person, and um, I, I, as a biographer, struggled quite a bit with trying to decide how much of her personal life to bring into the book and how to do so. I like to respect the people that I'm writing about. On the other hand, I think we can't fully understand the significance or remarkable achievements of Kamala Devi and her life if we don't understand the constraints that she was fighting against. And one of those constraints was the fact that her husband, while an incredibly creative and dynamic figure, was also someone that had many affairs with other women, had trouble uh, with alcohol, um, and caused a lot of trouble for Kamala Devi, both personally and then when she decided to divorce him, which was a very pioneering move in that time, um, that the very act of the divorce created more problems for Kamala Devi because even many of her close colleagues criticized her for making that decision and it became a real issue for her in her political trajectory. That's something I can talk more about um, if you're interested. Um, so I, I chose to write about those facets of her life, although as delicately and respectfully as I could, because they speak to her remarkable character. And let me just give you one example. I'm moving towards wrapping up. I want to make sure we have time for conversation. But this might actually be the part of the story that I found most moving. Um, so if you could advance one slide for me. Uh, oh, this is, sorry, forgive me. This is, I, I have a slide here just show, um, showing uh, Kamala Devi with Sarajini Naidu, who, as many of you know, was another extremely important uh, figure in the anti-colonial freedom struggle, famous poet. Um, if we were going to you know, rank uh, leading Indian women of the 20th century, these two would both be very high on the list. Um, they're also sisters-in-law. Sarjini Naidu was uh, sister of Hrindana Chattopadhyay and um, was very opposed to the divorce. Um, and that caused a lot of tensions um, between them, but also in the broader freedom struggle. Again, I can talk more about that. Okay, one more slide, please. Ah, yes. Okay, this is the image I wanted to share with you all. Um, so this is um, Indrani Raman, who um, was a remarkable figure of her own in a variety of ways. But this is Kamala Devi giving an award not to Indrani Raman, but to um, Indrani's uh, mother, who was a very complicated and fascinating figure, who um, was uh, actually born in the United States, a white woman, who decided to really so fully embrace her identity within India that she changes her name uh, to Rajani Devi and becomes a very famous advocate of uh, Indian classical dance. Um, travels around the world representing Indian classical dance. Um, you, we could say many things just about her, but the reason this story becomes relevant to Kamala Devi is that at one point Ra uh, Rajani Devi uh, meets Harindra Chattopadhyay this is actually in the middle of the Salt Satyagraha when Kamala Devi is fighting against colonial rule and eventually ending up in prison for doing so. Her husband is having an affair with this uh, woman in the United States. They then, uh, Harinjanath and Rajani Devi, travel to Europe, um, then to uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and there they split up. And Rajani Devi comes to India um, where it turns out she's pregnant. Um, and at that time, it's not known as the, who the father is. Um, she is, her, like Harindranath is married to Kamala Devi. Rajani Devi is married to a, uh, a, an Indian anti-colonial activist living in the United States. Um, 
So here's where the story gets so moving, right? Forgive me, it's a little convoluted, but here's where it gets so moving. So Kamala Devi learns about this saga while in jail, right? So she learns her husband has had yet another affair, that the woman has shown up in India alone and pregnant. Okay, and, this, and the child might actually be that of her husband. All right, how does Kamala Devi respond? She writes to close friends and says, take care of this woman. Go to her, make sure she has a place to live, make sure she has what she needs to care for the child. She reaches out from jail to support this woman that's had an affair to her husband because she recognizes that this is a, an, a, another human being in need, but also a woman in need, right? And that stirs in her this profound sympathy that again has crossed the divide. I think it's the same sympathy that leads her to say on that train, I am a colored woman. It's her ability to look across those divides, right? And say, that person is struggling against something too, and I'm gonna be there for them. And, and so this award that Kamala Devi is giving to Indrani is actually an award to Rajani Devi, this woman that had an affair with Kamala Devi's husband. Kamala Devi is honoring that woman, giving the award to her daughter. Um, the, the granddaughter actually writes very movingly about this in a memoir I'd recommend to you. It's a very beautiful memoir. Um, writes very movingly about this and pays tribute to Kamala Devi for her broad human spirit. Um, I myself as well was just profoundly moved by that particular story and that connection. And I'd like to end there by looking, I started at the end, I came back to the beginning, I'm circling all the way back around um, to just point out that I think at the core of who Kamala Devi was, was someone who refused to be bounded, right? She was a radical who never wanted to be limited, but it wasn't just about her own spirit, right? The spirit of a radical, or sometimes we can see that as very individualistic. No, be, she refused to be bounded and because of that, she was able to build bridges with others, with the struggles of others, to reach out to others and forge solidarities and connections. Um, and this is my favorite Kamala Devi quote. Um, I think that's part of why beauty meant so much to her. This is a quote she told to a group of students in the 1930s that then I think really carries through all the rest of her life. Beauty is the soul of freedom. What does this mean to me? Freedom for Kamala Devi is not about the individual breaking out of bounds, but the individual connecting to something larger to them, right? Isn't that what beauty does when we listen to an amazing piece of music, when we experience a wonderful work of art? It's not about us anymore, right? It's not an individual selfish act. It's about us connecting to something larger, whether that's the tradition of Indian art, which Kamala Devi was deeply connected to, the larger traditions of art across the world, the divine, however we want to define it, it's a larger connection that linked Kamala Devi to many others. Um, one more slide, please. Um, so in writing this book, it's a book that was shaped by my own deep personal connection to Kamala Devi, by my incredible respect for the work that she did throughout her remarkable life. But ultimately, friends, at the end of the project, what made it so meaningful to me was that I just found Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay as a human being, such a remarkable figure, someone that all of us should uh, respect and be able to learn from. So again, I, I want to say very deep gratitude to uh, Ramachandra Guha for inviting me to write this book originally and helping shepherd me through it from the very first time we met 20 years ago. I want to express gratitude to the Bangalore International Center for having me here and to all of you. This is the part I'm most excited about. Um, I think Ram and I are going to sit here and we'll turn on the lights and we'll have a conversation. So I'm looking forward to learning from you all. Thank you again very, very much. Thank you, Nico, for that wonderful presentation. Before I open it out to the audience, I want to say that there's so many, di as you've seen from the presentation, and as some of you already know, there's so many diverse strands to Kamala Devi's life and legacy. And in Nico's book, they've been beautifully interwoven. You know, it's a work of uh, masterful scholarship and literary artifice at the same time, as you'd see uh, when you read it and when you buy it and read it. Now. Uh, the floor is open. If people put up their hands, I will call upon them. And uh, don't grab the mic, please. Yes, that lady there. Yeah. There'll be time for everyone to ask questions and offer comments. Yeah, the lady there. Thank you. you want to Thank stand up and introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah, Satna. Thank you so much for the incredible book. I'm 100 pages down. My question is regarding, I think Kamla Bai was an incredible writer. 
And so in your research, did you come across any of her personal papers? How does her writing pan out when, when it's a private paper and when it's in a book? I'm very intrigued by her writerly role. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a, 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 t a rare time when the question that is asked is exactly what I wanted to say. Because when Ram uh, briefly mentioned um, that I tried my best to make this a, a book that wouldn't uh, read as an academic tome, but would read with, with some kind of uh, vital energy, I was really m moved to do that in part just by the very fact that, as you said, Kamala Devi was herself a writer. That's actually part of how she understood herself. She writes um, several d different junctures in her life about how important her writing was, not just to her career, but also to her mental health and her sense of well-being. She talks about how when, when her life is at its hardest, she's often called to write, and it helps calm her down and get her through. She was very prolific. She wrote uh, many books, e extraordinary numbers of articles in the, in the popular press. And you ask a very interesting question, which is, well, how, what kind of lens do we get on her life as a writer when we look not just at those public works, but also at her personal private papers. The first thing that comes to my mind is that if you look at the range of Kamala Devi's public works, you find um, a lot of very beautiful narrative. You find a lot of political polemic, right? She was a fierce advocate for her viewpoints on things, a very talented uh, editorial writer in, in newspapers and elsewhere. You don't get much of her sense of humor. Whereas if you look at her letters, her private papers, you see a Kamala Devi who had a very sharp and biting sense of humor, She's very witty, um, and, and often hilarious in her opinions of others. So again, I mentioned Mr. Rajiv Sethi is here. One thing we corresponded with is Kamala Devi's uh, role in helping to, uh, to found the World Crafts Council, uh, which is, as I expect many of you know, a very important institution in the sort of global history of crafts. Kamala Devi was involved at the outset, um, one of the vice presidents of the organization. She became very critical over time of the direction the organization took and some of the key figures involved. I haven't seen many examples of her sharing that criticism publicly, but when you look in her letters, she is not shy about letting you know who she's critical of, and often in very funny ways. So she was a very talented writer, but also a funny one. That comes out more in her personal papers. So just a footnote to uh, uh, Nico's uh, answer. You know, one of the aspects of her life, which people who know her work in the crafts movement and maybe even the feminist movement, don't, uh, uh, for understandable reasons are not that aware of, is her work in the Congress Socialist Party, mm. which was a quite remarkable organization. You know, the Congress Socialists were opposed to the communists because they felt the communists were not patriotic enough. I mean, the communists took their orders from Stalin in the Soviet Union. But they also found um, uh, the Orthodox Congress very patriarchal, and they were very innovative. I mean, they were pioneers of decentralization of environmental sensibility, of feminism. And uh, one of her greatest colleagues, I mean, some of the Congress socialists are well known, they lived on for a long time afterwards, particularly uh, pe two people, two men who had great political influence in independent India, Ramanur Loya and Jayaprakash Narayan. But a third who died young, tragically young, was an extraordinary Bombay socialist called Yusuf Mehrari, who coined the slogan, Quit India, uh, which is well known. But he says somewhere, there's a lovely quote in this book where he says, Kamala Devi went everywhere with her typewriter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, even in every yes. second, third class train journey, she yes. had her typewriter. Right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I love that image that Mehrali provides of Kamala Devi sitting in the train, typing away with that typewriter. She was a writer, uh, in addition to all the other things she did. Absolutely. Question from anyone in the back? Yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Archish Mandir. Yeah. Introduce yourself as you get up. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Archish Man. Uh, thanks, Nico, for your talk. I had a broad and then two specific questions related to it, uh, which is on where you started about you know her fight against segregation in the South and how she refuses to give up her seat. Did you get an idea of where she got uh, the consciousness of being an anti-racist? Why going to the US, she decides to go to the South? Uh, and two specific questions were, you know, in her memoir, she mentions meeting the black Muslims in the north, and could you find out more about that? She mentions Atiya Begum, and second, whether she ever mentions reading or knowing about the great African American uh, writer W. E. B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Ajishman. These are all questions close to my heart. As you know, my introduction to Kamala Devi was in my own dissertation, which is on the linkages between the Indian freedom struggle and African-American struggles. That's where Kamala Devi started for me. So this question is very dear to my heart. I think her connection to the anti-racist movement comes out of her experience in the international women's movement. As I mentioned briefly, when she goes to Europe to participate in these gatherings of women from around the world, she's very quick to realize that many of these women are perfectly happy to denounce patriarchy and sexism, but they're not saying anything about imperialism, and they're not saying anything about racism. And Kamala Devi's not one to remain quiet when she sees an injustice at hand. So she speaks up along with other um, delegates from India, from the Global South, of whom there weren't very many at these international gatherings. I think her experience in those gatherings early on in life helps shape her sense of the global struggle against white supremacy. But to be honest, I still find it remarkable just how deeply enmeshed she becomes in the black freedom struggle. When she comes to the US, it's not as if she just happens to be um, you know, harassed on that train and speaks out. She goes out of her way to visit African-American activists in Harlem and elsewhere, to stay with African-American families. And part of why she goes to the South is precisely to stand up in opposition to Jim Crow racism. This is an active choice. Um, you ask about her connection to uh, African-American Islam. That's a facet of her life that we only see retrospectively from her writings later. She has a very interesting article that she publishes in the 70s called Black Power on the Move, in which she talks about her experience of finding uh, African-American Muslims in New York and, and finding quite intriguing their connection to Islam and, and through Islam to South Asia. Um, I didn't find any sources at the time that that would flesh out that aspect of the experience. I'd be very curious. On the other hand, I think her relationship to Du Bois is, is quite rich and intriguing. I couldn't find examples of her um, discussing directly the legacy of Du Bois on her life, but it's clear that it had a huge impact because this language of the darker races and the colored world that she advanced is something that really Du Bois is the pioneer of. He had a huge influence on many anti-colonial figures in India, as you know, um, Nehru famously, but many others were very interested in Du Bois and his writings. Um, and Kamala Devi uh, taps into that, but then acts on it in a way that I think uh, exceeds pretty much every other South Asian figure that I've come across. Or certainly, one, she's one of the most compelling figures who says, I'm not just going to talk about those sorts of solidarities, I'm going to actively live them. Just a, a follow-up to that while we wait for other questions. You know, um, what are the, I mean, it's quite extraordinary, her bravery. Uh, just, uh, and her independence of spirit and her courage. Uh, a young Indian woman traveling in the American South. There's also, as you show in, her, uh, in your book, in the 30s and 40s, she's traveling alone in China, Japan, Sri Lanka. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, very, odd. it's not like the way people travel now, right? It's in... Uh, T difficult circumstances to st steamers and you know rickety uh, trucks and, and trains, and uh, it's all. But yet, and I, I'd like to say something about this because you didn't say so in your talk, and your book talks about it. Yet, uh, for all that she's a feminist icon, she refused to call herself a feminist. So tell us a little bit about that. Why was that? I'm happy to say more about that. Yeah. So, like many of her. Uh, colleagues in the Indian women's movement, she was deeply skeptical of the term feminism, which she saw as a Western import. And she saw, I think, rightly as a term that could be quite divisive and could box women in by suggesting that their struggles should somehow be separate from the other commitments that Kamala Devi was a part of. So she was very opposed to sexism and patriarchy, but as she writes very clearly and movingly at many junctures in her life, she was also very aware that women weren't the only group that was being discriminated against. And she wanted to actively collaborate with men who were fighting against class inequity, fighting against caste, fighting against British imperialism, et cetera. So she rejects the label feminist. Now that, as I said, is not a, um, uh, an unusual move in the 30s and 40s, but it does cause some tension with younger uh, Indian feminists, particularly in the 70s. That's a time in life where Kamala Devi can, 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 like many of her, her generational peers, can come to seem old-fashioned um, and sort of behind the times in her approach to these issues. This is a place where I'm, I'm afraid that my biographer's sympathies are perhaps maybe too obvious. 
but I, I find that um, although one could critique Kamala Devi for some of the ways that she um, approaches sexism and patriarchy towards the end of her life, if you're understanding where she's coming from, it becomes quite apparent that really her goal is not to downplay sexism. Throughout her life, she remains a fierce critic of sexism in all its varieties, but she's also actively committed to these other struggles, and she doesn't like the idea that the feminist movement would hive itself off from these other struggles. She wants women, part of this is about believing in, in the freedom of women to be activists, not just as women, but also as people who care about all of these other issues, right? It's expanding the role of responsibility of women and saying we're not gonna be just boxed in on that one particular issue. Uh, yeah, at the back, right at the, I'll come to you. Right at the back, yeah, yeah, yeah. You stand up, can you stand up and then I'll come to the person next to you, then I'll come in front, Ram. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Hemant. So this was a fantastic talk and I'm learning a lot. Um, so I'm really interested to understand uh, that there was a debate going on in the colonial period about whether it was the imperialism of the British that led to the gr growth of feminism or that brought women out of their shackles. Mm -hmm. So how might have Kamala Devi have responded to these? Like, I'm, I'm really interested to know how she might have thought about these. Uh, thank you for this question. Kamala Devi was pretty solidly on the side of folks that were not um, uh, likely to give the British much credit for doing uh, much in regard to fighting against social inequities with, within India. And I think there's good reason for that uh, because, you know, if you look at the legacy of, of colonial approaches to these issues, while you can find examples of institutions that were formed or certain legislation that was passed that had some positive outcome, I think the sum picture is one in which these sorts of social reforms are packaged in a way that's meant to maintain British rule and also to be used as a sort of cudgel to suggest that Indian society is too hierarchical, too divided, too backwards, et cetera. And it's not just the British. I'm, I'm an American, so I love making fun of the British. Uh, but sadly, in this case, perhaps the most um, uh, disreputable figure is an American woman named Catherine Mayo, who I expect many of you are familiar with, who writes this book, Mother India, um, which it's, it's a complicated book to grapple with because it's a book that holds up many problems within Indian society, problems that Kamala Devi herself would heartily acknowledge, not just sexism and patriarchy, but also caste and other issues. So Mayo takes some, some truths, some real issues that have to be confronted, but she uses them to directly justify British rule. And Kamala Devi wants nothing to do with that. So you know, you're right that there is a debate there, and the debate continues even among scholars today. How are we to make sense, of, for example, of Catherine Mayo's book? There are feminists who have held it up as a, a pioneering text that's you know, denouncing patriarchy. Kamala Devi is very solidly on the other end of that debate. Her, her view is, yes, we must fight against sexism and patriarchy, but we have to do so at exactly the same time we fight against um, about, against imperialism and racism. And when she goes abroad, for example, in the United States, she often speaks uh, in, in front of women's groups um, and is very direct with people. Again, she, she doesn't suffer fools. She tells these groups very directly, um, you might think I'm here as a sort of um, you know, downtrodden Indian woman who's being oppressed because I'm like, no, that's not here. I'm here because I want to talk to you about the dynamic role that Indian women are playing in the fight against British imperialism. That's the story she tells. And it's a story that is against patriarchy. It's a story about the empowerment of women. But hers is a much more um, forward thinking, I think, and more inclusive vision of the struggle against patriarchy. Um, and, and one in which British rule is, is uh, really uh, not, not, doing, not doing much good. So I just, uh, uh, before I come to the next question, Nico, on this whole question of, um, you know, there's a very uh, intense and active debate about British colonialism and its impact on India. You know, was it good, was it bad? Did it bring modernity? Did it make us more backward? Now, it's very nuanced, and it's, uh, we've go I mean, we've gone from, uh, British arrogance and condescension to nationalist xenophobia, which is equally, equally crude. And if you look at you know, uh, inequality uh, in Indian society, so there are three axes of inequality. One is class, uh, historically, class, gender, and caste. When it came to class and gender, British rule did nothing to challenge structures of inequality. It did really nothing to challenge patriarchy. When it came to class, if you look at the systems of landholding 
uh, and that were introduced, particularly the permanent settlement, they may have intensified agrarian economic inequality. But when it came to caste, the British were indirectly beneficial to the undermining of the caste system. And this is something nationalists even today find it hard to appreciate and understand. But Ambedkar knew it. Fule knew it. Uh, the great uh, Periyar knew it. You know, uh, all the anti-caste crusaders of the British period, you know, uh, as I said, Fule and Savitri Fule in Maharashtra, Ambedkar in Maharashtra, Periyar in Tamil Nadu. There's a, f a fascinating book on the Punjab written by Mark Jugansmaya, uh, which features a man called Mangu Ram, who started an Adi Dharam movement outside the Hindu fold. He was a Dalit. Because uh, the national movement was Brahmanical. You know, uh, the RSS was Brahmanical, but so was the Congress. And it was uh, inadvertently by, through economic modernization, the greater pace of urbanization, and the railways and the industries and the factories open spaces for Dalits to get work and to escape the village and to escape the social stigma and prejudice. And uh, so and Ambedkar and that's a, there's a reason why Ambedkar and Fule, uh, uh, you know, admired the British and were suspicious of the Congress. Mm. So I just want to put this out because mm. young people today think all British rule was bad. Yes, of course, in many ways it was. But when it came to the Dalits, there was a pathway to emancipation, a limited pathway, a narrow pathway, uh, an imperfect and halting pathway, mm. which was then opened up further by people like Ambedkar, Fule, Periyar, and of course, all, all their followers. Yeah. Let me respond briefly because this raises, I think, two more important points. First, I'm really glad you mentioned caste. I've mentioned it myself a couple times, but I will say that um, as a biographer, um, when you're writing about someone you so deeply admire, one of the most important things, and this is something uh, Ram here has done marvelously well, is it's also important to recognize the failings of a human. Everyone is, is human, right? And you can't be perfect in all regards. I think one of uh, Kamala Devi's limitations was her views on caste. She was solidly opposed to untouchability and to caste, but like mo almost all of her Congress socialist colleagues, she believed that caste would fall away once class was dealt with and once British imperialism was removed. And so she didn't um, actively uh, fight against caste or lend much support to those who were fighting against it. Now, again, not because she didn't see it as a major problem, but because she was overly optimistic about the degree to which it would be resolved by resolving class inequity and other struggles. The other point I just want to make is that in regards to the British, um, Kamwadevi is one of many figures who I think bear uh, a witness to something that uh, Rom's written about somewhat recently, which is the fact that um, there were, of course, um, several uh, British individuals um, and other Western individuals who became very involved in the Indian freedom struggle, really leaving um, you know, their kith and kin to join the Indian freedom struggle, Mirabend, for example, and others. Um, and one of, the, one of the many things I do find remarkable about Kamala Devi is that although she's fiercely opposed to white supremacy and very aware of racism within the women's movement and other struggles, She's also very quick to make friends with uh, Western women, with American women, with European women. She forms very deep um, connections with them. So she's able to do something that I think is very important, which is she's able to op oppose a particular injustice while not labeling everyone in, in the you know, oppressing group as immediately culpable. Um, she doesn't respond to racism with some form of reverse racism or some form of xenophobia. She's very quick to embrace um, Western culture, for example. She's not a, a cultural nationalist or, or, or in any way xenophobic, and that's another thing I really admire about also, her. Also, as you show in your book, one of her early mentors, the Irish woman Margaret Cousins. So yes. One of the founders of the All India Women's um, you know, Federation, which you talk about. Yeah, there's a question there. Yeah. yeah please stand up. Yeah, hi, I'm Deshma. Thank you for coming here and uh, you know, educating us some more about Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. So in your uh, introductory talk, you mentioned that even though she joined the Saul Satyagraha, she actually wasn't a Gandhian. So I was curious about why not? Hmm. Thank you for the question. That, the relationship between Kamla Devi and Gandhi was amongst the most fascinating in the book and one that I, I still find of great interest. Um, I think the, the key, there may be two key differences between Gandhi and Kamala Devi, one of which I think um, grows smaller over time, um, and the other of which I think remains a, a source of divide. And then I can talk about some of their similarities as well. There are many connections as well, but at least two strong um, differences. One is that at least early on in, um, in, uh, in their connection, they're, they're in the 20s and 30s in particular, 
Kamala Devi is uh, much further to the left on the, in the progressive scale on a variety of issues. So if you think about gender, if you think about um, class, if you think about caste, it's hard to pin Gandhi down, or Ram can talk more about this than I can. Not caste. Because Gandhi in, uh, in uh, 1921, well before Kamala Devi entered politics, says, you know, we won't get Swaraj without abolishing untouchability. Gandhi calls the practitioners of caste the dyers of Hinduism, mm. but class and gender, certainly. Okay, I'll take that. Maybe, maybe uh, I'll take that distinction. Um, that, uh, that divide, I think, sh uh, um, shrinks over time. I think they're able to come together in a variety of ways, politically and socially and other causes. They le they're learning from each other in this regard. The, the, the key difference that I think remains is that um, Gandhi has a certain ascetic strand in his uh, philosophy and personal life um, that um, doesn't touch Kamala Devi directly. She's too much on with Tagore in terms of the importance of the aesthetic and in terms of the importance of beauty. Um, you know, I mentioned in the book that she's a huge fan of, of, uh, of traditional Indian fashion, for example, right? She loves beautiful saris um, in a way that, uh, you know, Gandhi uh, preferred much more austere dresses, all of you know. Um, so that, that divide remains there throughout, but it shouldn't obscure, I think, the many similarities between them and the way that Kamala Devi advances Gandhi's legacy. I think if you look at uh, Kamala Devi's commitment to handicrafts, there's a very direct link between the charka, right, the spinning wheel, and Gandhi's commitment to making things with one hand, to rural development that sidesteps massive industrialization, to pushing power down to the grassroots. These are all deeply Gandhian causes that Kamala Devi makes her own and, and advances moving forward. In fact, I might argue that although she's never a Gandhian devotee, I think she's one of the most important uh, interpreters of Gandhi's legacy in the post-independence period. One well, last, I think, a similarity between Kamala Devi and, and Gandhi uh, is that few people, I mean, if you, Gandhi and Kamala Devi, uh, travel to the remotest corners of India. You know, Nehru did it, and uh, Indira Gandhi and Narendra Modi did it, but in a different capacity and from up there, right? Uh, uh, so Gandhi and Kamala Devi went, you know, by train, bullock cart, with an, out of curiosity, uh, asking questions of peasants and weavers and... And I think in that sense, Kamala Devi, we're reading your book, it's extraordinary, you know, where all, where all she went. Yeah, no. And even, late, even very late in life, she just keeps traveling, keeps traveling. It's, it is quite remarkable. Uh, Ram, this is, uh, my name is Ram, and this is to Ram, who, and I've, somebody who studied his work for 20 years. Uh, you've literally taken this as a mission in your life to resurrect Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. And, uh, uh, no, but I'm, I'm very curious, uh, uh, how did you kind of uh, decide to kind of bring her? Because in our history books, we studied Sarasri Naidu, and kind of that's it. W why was she kind of yeah. not brought into the? Yeah, so no, I, I mean, this is. I mean, I'm just truly thrilled to have uh, seen Nico produce this wonderful book, which will take her life and all its richness and diversity and complexity and angularity to everyone. It's also being published in America. This book, so it'll take it to the world. You know, um, I kind of regret. I mean, Nico talks about my our conversations about the book, and I read drafts, but I kind of regret not passing on something to him, uh, which is, um, you know, I wrote a biography of Eric Elvin, and uh, Elvin uh, was, a, uh, was a British uh, scholar and priest who comes to India to indigenize Christianity and then joins Gandhi and, and so on and so forth. But his first home base in India is Pune. So here he is in his uh, early 20s, and he befriends Kamala Devi, who's acting in Pune, you know. And there's a letter somewhere I read, unfortunately I didn't keep a note because it wasn't inter of interest enough to me, where uh, he is writing to his mother, saying, I met this wonderful woman, young Indian woman, you know, and it's very rare to meet an English woman or an Indian woman whom we can befriend in those days, the 1920s, and share a conversation about literature and art. And then he talks about it, then she says, he says, this is what, I don't have, a, uh, I remember the, where the letter was, so I couldn't tell Nico, where he says, he tells his mother, her husband is treating her very badly. Oh. Oh. <laughs> now, I, that struck me, and I did get, take a note, which was not relevant to what I did. But later on, I found that Kamala Devi wrote a book on tribalism in India, dedicated to Varya Elvin. And in Elvin's diary in Shillong, when he is dying, one of the last people he sees is Kamala Devi. He sees visiting Shillong. So I suppose that was part of it. Then there was Gandhi. Then I should also say that uh, someone who's not here in the audience today, but will be in Chennai when Nico speaks 
on Kamala Devi tomorrow in Chennai, uh, a close friend of mine whom I befriended about 30 years ago, who knew uh, Kamala Devi very well and has helped Nico a lot in his book, uh, uh, is Gopal Gandhi, known to many people uh, in this audience. I do always had one of the photos of Kamala Devi that uh, Nico showed was, uh, and so I, I mean, it's just extraordinary the range of her life. And I always felt that, you know, I mean, again, this is just a kind of a wild thesis, but one of the, possibly one of the reasons Kamala Devi, apart from the circle of people who work in the craft, some who are over here, uh, and the odd historian of Indian feminism, one of the reasons she may not have been so well known uh, is, again, this is, this is not something that should concern Nico, or, because he's done full justice to her and he's made her well known, is that she and Indira Gandhi did not get along. Uh, I mean, in Delhi today, you will meet people who will say, Indira Gandhi started the Crafts Museum. And that is the received wisdom passed on by Indira Gandhi and her descendants. Maybe Indira Gandhi revived the high handicrafts industry also. I mean, Indira Gandhi was a remarkable person, and she encouraged a lot of great work in all this field. But they, she also had a rivalry. But I'll just say one last thing, Nicole, and then, then I'll, you know, uh, uh, this is something Gopal Gandhi told me, which is, again, it's anecdotal, so we can't, can't go into the book. You know, Kamala Devi did not join the cabinet after independence. And Gopal thinks that she did not, she was, I mean, she, she had a sense of her presence and her importance in the Indian nationalist and feminist firmament. firmament. And Rajkumari Amrit Kaur was given a cabinet position. And I think Nehru offered her a minister of state. Right. So I think in some of this, there's this, so but, I mean, it just, the more I, when I read, I kind of had a vague sense of how extraordinary her life was. Because I had interacted, I, I encountered it at different stages in my own research. But it's only when I read Nico's wonderful book that I could actually dare to compare her with Tagore. I mean, I'm grateful to. It's only when I read the, the, the depth of his research and all that, he's, all, all that he's brought out. So, I mean, this book will just bring her for everyone, you know, beyond uh, the circles in which she's, the, the crafts people and, of course, the feminists, in which she's already known. Yeah, yeah, please. Hi, my name is Vebhav, and Professor Slate, thank you so much for your presentation. I wanted to ask about Kamla Devi's views on aboriginals. Given that she traveled uh, throughout the America and the South, did she make it to Oklahoma or any of the other reservations? And were there any exchanges with Native American leaders? And then sort of, uh, you know, coming back to the Indian sphere, I know Dr. Guha just mentioned her book in Shillong on the tribals. Mm. But I was curious to know how her work in the sphere of crafts influenced her view of, uh, you know, of uh, the issue of scheduled tribes in India and their rights and political representation. Thank you very much for the question. First, yes, she did connect with um, those that have been known as Native Americans or often these days are known as American Indians, right? Um, she did connect with those communities when she was in the United States. I don't know as much as I would like to. There isn't very much in the record about exactly what those conversations look like, but she travels to the American West in part to forge connections with those communities. She's very interested in their struggles. It's part of her interest in these global solidarities. And then, of course, yes, within India itself, she spends quite a lot of time um, traveling in, in uh, Adivasi areas, in, in connecting with artists and craftspeople who are uh, advancing traditions from those various communities. And she's very um, uh, both appreciative of those arts and crafts, the forms themselves, and also very concerned about their maintenance and their preservation in the face of the many constraints and pressures facing those communities, everything from um, loss of land to, um, you know, the, the encroachment of um, cheaper forms of, um, uh, of mass-produced goods. Um, so she's, as she is across India, she, she is, has a special interest in trying to preserve Adivasi culture and cultures. But she also, in that book that Ram mentioned, she also has a strong argument that tries to not separate out those cultures from Indian culture writ large. Um, and this is something that was a little tricky for me, honestly, to write about in a way that I think gets the nuances right. Um, because it could be seen, I think, uh, on a quick read, it could be seen as a kind of crude uh, <coughs> nationalistic view of culture rather than cultures. Right? Kamala Devi was very interested in Indian culture, singular. And, and she could be potentially critiqued for that. But I think she was always very aware of diversity as well. I mean, if you look at her approach to crafts, it's about preserving local lineages and traditions. She's, she's not interested in 
bringing, you know, uh, Punjabi crafts to Tamil Nadu or vice versa. She wants to, uh, to identify and preserve these very local traditions, but she's also very aware and interested in how they're all part of this larger story of Indian arts and crafts, and she's very proud of that. So, and, and this, I think, connects to her view on Adivasis, is she wants to recognize their cultural traditions as distinct and unique, but also as in some ways foundational to this larger story of Indian culture. Uh, any more questions? Uh, if there are people here, if there are several people here who knew Kamla Devi, uh, if they'd like to come and share some of their memories, I think. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. I, I'm very, very moved. I learned about this remarkable evening only a few hours ago as I was driving in from Madnapalli at Rishi Valley, where I spent a better part of yesterday talking about Krishna Ji and Bhupal Jack. And I would like to tell you that uh, um, you're the kind of person Kamala Ji would have loved enormously. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I would also request you to never think in definitive terms. There are no biographies that are definitive, especially for women like her. And when you go further into what I've just suggested, there was a whole epoch that shaped remarkable women for remarkable work. Mm -hmm. And I think, hopefully, you'll be fit enough to take another book when you can. But I wish you well. And I'm really going to complete my life uh, reading your book. Just bought it. Thank you very much. Uh, I just uh, thank you, Rajiv. I agree. Nothing is definitive. This is as close to being definitive as possible. I'll just say two things. One is, I think uh, it's because Nico never knew Kamla Devi that he could write this book. Mm. I think that's, that's possibly, or was came. And the other thing is done. What is that impressive uh, uh, in this book um, is a triumph of the biographer's art because Kamla Devi, he, Nico talked about working in Kamla Devi's papers, but they're very scanty. You know, I uh, have written two biographies, one of very relevant, and because he was an Englishman, uh, he wrote uh, to his mother three times a week, and because she was an English mother, she kept all the letters. <laughs> and he, he kept all the letters of his friends, so his archive is enormous. You know, it's more or less, week by week, you can trace his life. And you can also find the stuff about him in his school and his college, because the British keep records. Uh, then I wrote on Gandhi, and you know the mountain of... So, when I think of what Nico has done with such a scanty personal archive, you know, just scattered in different, a letter here, a letter there, how he's filled it in, how he looked at documents, at intelligence reports, at newspapers, at posters, at other people's letters. I mean, he's found a fascinating tranche of letters exchanged between Kamala Devi and some of our American friends in the crafts movement. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's really a triumph of the biographer's art because see, I say this is someone who's written two biographies of uh, individuals whose papers were totally intact, whose documentary record for almost all their life was, uh, so I think that's really, that's, it's really, that, which is why I called it a work of literary artifice, and I meant it uh, in a positive sense. And I hope uh, you, you biographers, whether Indian or American, uh, working on Indian subjects, read this book also for the methodological clues it gives on how to write about, about a person. Uh, shall we say, you know, it could be any of the remarkable figures of our modern history, you know, you just, just throw out a name and, uh, just out of the blue, shall we say, EMS Namudripat, or someone from our, uh, you know, our hometown, Girish Karnat. You know, you will not find uh, kind of uh, depth of correspondence and personal papers that Varya Relvin or Jawaharlal Nehru or uh, Radha Krishna or, and so on. And how to do that? I think that's really, I, I was really, that I found really deeply impressive in your book, that how you filled in all those blanks uh, with your intelligent sleuthing. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Thank you. We still have a few minutes, if anyone else would like to... Uh... Okay. Uh, the book is on sale outside, and Nico will be signing them. Thank you, Nico. And, oh, thank you. Yeah. Please, 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 Ajit. Yeah. When, you, when you said about caste, uh, I've had several conversations with Kamla Devi on this issue of who she was working with. And as you noticed, all the skilled sector belongs to OBCs, belongs to the vulnerable. 
So she was very conscious of what she was doing to empower them. But caste was certainly an issue that came in. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv, and, and thank you all. This has been a real honor and a, a pleasure for me. And thank you to the BIC. And on behalf of BIC, I'd like to thank Nico and Ram for this session. As Ram mentioned, the books are available for sale outside, and I'm sure Nico will be happy to sign copies.